Uh, you should have received notes that went around, and those that'll be the last installment of notes for X. So um, I've been just I've never done a study myself, so I'm just kind of tracking with you guys, reading two chapters a week, and um, we're going to look at chapters. Last week we were supposed to do 19 and 20. This week 21, 22, and we'll probably just hover around 20, chapter 20. But with your notes, uh, if you're missing any parts, they are now posted. The whole document on the website. You can print off of that if you like. If you like, that's to print a copy. If that would help you, just let me know. I check and I got you. I'll have a copy for you. I'm sorry to talk to you on that. <laughs> if anything else would like a full copy, we can do that. Um, what I want you to see is we started at Acts chapter 1 on those notes. With the five, five column. first column is the basis for change is salvation. The agent or source in change is the Holy Spirit and the Word and the really spiritual people. Uh, third column is what is our responsibility in change? What do we see in Acts where we see something that we should, uh, that's our responsibility in the process in this partnership called sanctification with God. Um, the last, the fifth, fourth column is motivation. And then the last column is really the big purpose. Why are we doing this? What's the ultimate purpose? What does God receive from this? What is he seeking uh, as to his glory? So five columns, if, if we took the gospel of, of Matthew, which we've done, and put those notes and put them on this column, put Acts in this column, I think we're going to dive into like maybe Romans 6, 7, 8 this summer, just get into a Pauline heavy-duty sanctification section. You're going to see something as to distribution of points in the columns. So you're going to see what we would call progressive theology or the, the, biblical theology is a progression of theological thought and development, advancement of a truth, the, the blossoming of a truth. And it's really fun to watch the, where it begins in seed form and where the foundation is laid and then to see it grow and watch it branch out. And usually Revelation puts a cap on it, kind of completes it. So it's a neat study to watch. So what you're going to see in, in Matthew and in, in Acts is a lot of... Um, a, a lot of verses in that second column. And you're going to see the Word. You're going to see the Holy Spirit. And then on the either side of that second column, on the left side is salvation. And on the right side of it is change, change principles. And of course, it's going to be the Word which is needed in the salvation story. It's the Word that's involved in the sanctification story. The Holy Spirit convicts and regenerates on the whole on the, on the salvation side and he sanctifies and purifies and so on convicts and so on on the other column so you're not going to be surprised you're going to see a lot of preaching texts as you just walk through these pages if you just did a pure distribution man that second column is just boom it's the word it's the word it's the holy spirit and then you have all these salvation stories and so matthew had some of those but look at the south salvation stories, you know, Acts 2, Pentecost, you know, who shall call upon the name of the Lord, you know, just a lot of wonderful passages, chapter 2 on people getting saved at Pentecost, uh, chapter 3, you have an apostle preaching and telling folks to repent and be converted, um, Acts 4, you have some really neat you know, passages that there's no there's salvation in it, not in any other, other than Christ, no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And uh, just write down that column, just chapter after chapter, groups of people being saved, individuals being saved, and you just have this on and on and on going. It's just beautiful. But that second column is just the power of the Word and the Spirit of God. Then as you go through this, this package, you see some verses on the motivation column, not a lot. And then the, the end game, the purpose why are we doing this? The ultimate purpose for what we do, you know, whatever we do, we eat or drink, we do it for the glory of God. You don't see a lot of verses yet. They don't show up. Not many, just a couple. So when we get to a Pauline epistle, guess how the chart shifts? I just want you to, you know, I'm, I'm setting you up for the right answer, but what do you think this chart does? Where do you think the verses fall out? The first column about salvation, second column about the word, third about our responsibility, Four, the motivation, and the, or column five, the purpose. Where do you think it goes? In the book of Romans? Yeah, Romans or any of the epistles, really. 
What do you Romans think? Romans kind of hits them all. Yes, but... no question. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna keep seeing all five columns represented, but there's going to be a, a different look. Which column do you think is going to get filled in a little bit more? And you can guess. Probably the fifth one, God's purpose. Yeah. Yeah. So what's yeah. going to happen? We get to these epistles. You, you're, you're going to see when it comes to the doctrine of sanctification, Christ has laid the foundation. Acts, we're seeing a lot of action. We're seeing it being illustrated, people being saved and changing. And then Paul's going to develop the doctrine. Peter's going to develop the doctrine. And man, oh man, yeah, he's going to talk about salvation. Sam's right. He's going to talk about the importance of the word. You betcha. And then when you have in each of Pauline epistles, you have the first couple chapters dealing with those positional truths and salvation truths. And then it, it hinges or pivots on a therefore. And then you go into practice, 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 sanctification, man. And we're going to get we're going to get dumped on on the third column when we get to Paul. I mean, just dumped on. And we're going to see motives, why we do it. <laughs> It's going to, you're going to see a whole lineup of verses, and then it's going to be really refreshing to say, wow, this is why we, here's the purpose, here's the purpose, here's the end game. So I just want you, just a general observation for now, but when we get into the epistles, you're going to see a different shift, a different emphasis, and that's progression of, of doctrine. It's, it's just being unfolded before us, and you always have a foundation, and you have development, and you have a capstone. So some really neat stuff, just from a general observation. For our purposes tonight, if you would turn um, to the notes that begin with uh, chapter 20. Uh, let's just begin there. And I should have paginated it for you, my bad. Um, but you're going to see with chapter 20, and once again, not a lot of salvation verses in that first column. In fact, none, none, none directly, perhaps. But then you have a lot with the word. Uh, chapter 20, verse 20, verse 7, verse 2, verse 25. So pretty significant number of passages on the word. But uh, he's going to be talking to Christians. He's going to have a pastor's, pastor's conference in this chapter. And so you're going to see a lot of verses about our responsibility in growing. And you're going to see that there in verse 19, verse 21, verse 23, verse 24, verse 28, verse 31. 32, 34, 35, 36. So a huge thrust on our responsibilities. And that's because Paul is, is preaching to a church and he's preaching to pastors. And we're going to look at the first church service recorded in Acts where it gives you a little bit more details of what a church service looked like in the first century. So uh, we're, going to, we're going to dive in here to um, Acts chapter 20. So if you just want to follow with me, we're going to look at these themes and especially on the talk, topic of change, you're going to see a lot, especially tonight, where before we're not seeing a lot of sanctification passages. They're there, but uh, because of the context of this chapter, a little bit more normal. And I think it's the most densely concentrated chapter on, on sanctification. Why? You're in church. Church is for believers. No problem bringing unsaved people to hear the gospel. I'm good with that. Paul's good with that. He talks about um, how your, your decorum, how you should conduct yourself in a church so if an unsaved person comes they don't think you're crazy <laughs> that they're impressed by the word of god and there's a fear of god and it impacts them for salvation uh, but but the work of the evangelism it was out outside of these house churches it, in fact the house churches were very vulnerable because the persecution was so severe you, they, they almost had a code you know you, we're going to meet at so-and-so's house and unless you're a believer don't don't invite folks here because we don't know if they'll turn us in because it was illegal to be a Christian to 311 AD. It's illegal. Okay. And depending which which emperor is in, in play, it, it, it does this number of severity for Christians. But there's 10 Roman waves of persecution in the first three centuries. So there's 10 horrific uh, windows. And uh, the, the Romans were very upset with the Christians because the Christians were atheists. The Christians were atheists. They did not believe in the Roman gods. And they did not believe in the Roman gods. And they called them atheists. They heard rumors that they, hey, Big John, they, they, we were waiting. We're going to get started now. Guys, can we get started? So you started without me. John has a big case of ADD. So we're going to 
So good to see you. I so we talked about this. We, we did talk about this, John. You're 30 minutes late. Yeah. I hope you're closing a deal. I, I right. hope, I hope you're closing a deal. We're in Acts chapter 20. So, um, so for the Christians, Does that come after Romans. Yes, near there. I knew there. So for the the world, the Christians were, were an anomaly. First, they thought it was just another Jewish thing because it starts out in Jerusalem. So, so if you're a Roman, you're thinking, is this a Jewish? Another just a you know they have a split. And um, and then they heard about this holy kiss. That was weird. And then uh, there's rumors of eating someone's body and drinking the blood and the Romans they thought that was kind of peculiar almost cannibalistic so it's interesting reading the Romans the unsaved world view this church meeting in these homes and um, what they would conclude on they didn't understand them but they did say this over and over and over the main thing you'll read in the Romans writings is that these Christians loved one another they loved each other Okay, that was a dominant theme. And the more they persecuted this little group called the church, the more they grew. They couldn't stop it. Uh, they would have public executions, and the, and the people would, who, who loved the Lord would, would sing while they burned to death. Or they would pray for their adversary as they chopped their heads off. And they would do it with joy. And, and what happened, it, there were so many people getting saved at these events that they started to do them in, in private, but they wouldn't even execute it publicly because too many people were believing in this Jesus. Okay. So this was a real problem to the Roman Empire, this Christian group. So while uh, the house church was pretty, very careful who they let in initially. And I thought of having a service, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be original because it's happened before, where we all come in and we have these guys come in, look like Communist Party members come in with their guns. The problem is we have so many guys packing heat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think they'd all be taken out. <laughs> but might cause problems with the elderly, too. I think it caused a lot of problems. I'm not doing it, but I thought of it where they come in. And say, if you're really a Christian, you know, you stay in there. If not, you know, I'll kill you. We're going to kill the Christians, you know. And you stay if you're really a Christian, and we're going to kill you. If not, you can leave. And everyone, you know, kind of sorts it out who's who's willing to die who's willing not you know i'm not going to do that because like i said i think they'd be taken out pretty quickly <laughs> there's some good guys all right so let's talk about this this growing church in uh the first century <laughs> verse one of chapter 20 and after the uproar this is this is at ephesus where they just went just crazy over their their temple of diana it's being challenged by these gospel preachers. They just went absolutely uh, berserk. And they, they were going to kill Paul. Paul walked into the place. He, he would have been killed. Paul wanted to. He wanted to preach that great crowd, but it, it wouldn't have ended well. So Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. So he's going he's gonna to leave now Asia Minor, Turkey, modern-day Turkey, and he's going to go up into Greece, the Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece. So Paul's, you know, making, we're looking at really the end of his third mission trip here. And there in Greece, he abides three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him as he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to return from Macedonia. So here's, here's what's happening. Um, Paul has heard really sad news, kind of like what's happening in ancient, you know, modern day uh, Myanmar, formerly known as Burma. The Christians are being killed right now. We have some friends that are watching this, Colin Richards from our church, but others, and they, they want to destroy the church. They want to just destroy it. And these Jews, they knew Paul was, was, was basically planning to go back to Jerusalem. And there's different ways you can do it from where they were here. One is by, by boat, which is the fastest. You just go down down the Mediterranean to a port that was presently controlled by Syria. And then you just drop a hundred and some miles down in Jerusalem. So Paul's uh, trying to, you know, to do this, but he hears that the, the Jews were laying in wait for him as he was about to sail. So the, the idea is if he gets on that boat, they're going to probably throw him overboard. Or, or kill them in one way or another on that boat. 
and that boat doesn't give you a lot of uh, wiggle work. So fortunately, he gets word of this. So he purposes to return from Macedonia. So he's going to go just the opposite direction initially to do a loop to get back to Jerusalem. So just logistically, things are really topsy-turvy. Uh, but what he's trying to do, he's going to these Gentile churches that he and others started, and he's telling them the problem. He's saying, we have Jews in Jerusalem that have loved our Savior Jesus, and because they're following Jesus as their Messiah, they're, getting, they're losing their jobs. Uh, they're being persecuted. They're dying. They're being ostracized or kicked out of their synagogues. They're in a, they're in a world of hurt. And uh, they complicate things, there's going to be a famine. And so Paul is raising money uh, to take back with him. He's going to have a number of guys with him, so there's accountability with the finances. He's not going to do that all by himself. But uh, he's, he's raising funds. How much? Probably a lot. Uh, there's a lot of church, a lot of believers in that church. church. So uh, he thinks that, that one, it'll meet a need of the, the Jewish believer, but also the idea of giving it to them from Gentile hands really demonstrates the, the way the church should be. It's, it's, it's they're, you know, Jews and Gentiles, bond and free, male and female, whatever, whatever. And um, he thought this would be a great unifying practice to take this offering. And he wasn't sure they were going to accept the money. He wasn't sure they were going to accept the money. And I remember offending a Jewish guy in our church here when I just came, a uh, Jewish uh, lawyer, a uh, nice guy, Dan. Uh, we, we hiked together, and I was talking about how Moses was taking offerings, and he said uh, to the Jewish nation, we have enough, stop giving. And I said something stupid like, you know, when do you hear a, something about telling Jews, when do you know when Jews stop wanting an offering? Like, <laughs> something something yeah. really distasteful. I, I, I can see you walk right into that one. Oh, I do. It was really yeah. a stupid thing to say. It was really a stupid thing. I wasn't meaning to be offensive, but I was. And he was so offended. I felt so horrible. <coughs> I, asked him, I asked him for forgiveness. Uh, but Paul's praying that they'll actually accept the offering because it comes from Gentile hands and Gentile currencies. And it, it, it's this is a weird you know, combination. Um, but anyway, so he's going to get down there, hopefully, you know, back to Jerusalem. Now, the year is 56, 57. It's debated, you know, which one, but it's 56 or 57 AD. Uh, the months are creeping by. He's delayed. His goal was to get there to help that church, but to be there at the Passover. That, that is the most dynamic time to be in Jerusalem for an evangelist. Uh, that's when the Jews are there by requirement. If they're under Old Testament considerations, and he's hoping to be there with, with all the Jewish nation there and preach. But now, because of this uh, plot to kill him and a delay and a loop to do here, he's just hoping to get there by the summer, by the next Jewish feast, which is Pentecost. So he's going to go, and he's accompanied, verse 4, into Asia, uh, into Asia, Sopater of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, uh, Aristarchus and Segundus. And Gaius of Derby, and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus, Tychicus and Trophimus. And uh, he's going to add uh, two other guys to Luke, probably will represent Philippi, and Titus, probably representing Achaia. So he's got a you know a pretty neat group here of, of leaders from the different churches. And um, they're, what would you call them? Delegates? <laughs> Representatives? Sure. And uh, they have helped their churches raise the money. They're, they're all kind of watching the, the bag. They're all going to be part of the transition of, from A to B to make sure they get what was given. So you see, you see throughout the New Testament, enormous accountability of finances. And uh, churches, you know, how many of you have a horror story about church finances? <laughs> you know, I mean, really, I mean, they're a dime a dozen. They're a dime. No pun intended. Uh, yeah, it was. <laughs> but no, it's true. Finances can be a real, real bugaboo for, for churches where they're just not careful. And Paul is very careful. He's a nice team here. And uh, it's probably a pretty sizable offering. So uh, they're going to come. They rendezvous at a point called Troas, verse 5. And then we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. So unleavened bread is that week. Which is, which is kind of the placeholder for the for the Passover and first fruits feast. So uh, he, he misses misses what he wanted to do, but he does come to Troas, um, 
and he stays there in Troas for five days, or stays there for seven days, and then from there he's going to complete his journey in just a moment. This is a big trip. Uh, I did the did some of the route and kind of did the mileage. When Paul finally gets back to Jerusalem, he is going 5,580 miles by land at a minimum and 6,770 miles by sea, so over 12,000 miles. So these mission trips, are these are no little little, little, little jaunts. How long did it take him? Years. So here he's coming um, in A.D., let's say, 57. Um, in verse 7, notice he's here now, Traz, and upon the first day of the week, we're finally getting a, a, a church service. So on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Amen to that. I love it. <laughs> yeah. um, That's what it feels like Sunday. Thank you, John. That's new. <laughs> That's new. That's <laughs> midnight, John. Um, but this, this is a long service, but notice the service was likely begun at night. And why would church be at night? Why would they have an evening service? So they could sneak in? <laughs> Is that right? No kidding? Partly, partly. Sure. What else? Everybody worked. Yeah. You um, work on Sunday. So they didn't have a day off on Sunday? No, they had a day off on Saturday. Yeah, I'm kidding. They're Jews. <laughs> Many of them are Jewish converts. All they, the Jewish people they work for, they have Saturdays off. Yeah. Monday's first day of work, man. You go to work. Yeah. So the, so the early church, especially in the Jewish areas, yeah, you worshiped on the day of resurrection, but you probably worked all day. Okay? Now, later the church becomes more Gentile, and then almost solely Gentile. So it's no longer an issue about that Sabbath thing. So so that's a real issue in the you know, early church is uh, when do we worship on this first day? In, in many cases, it was only in the evening. Um, the Sabbath was an issue. The Jews had to wrestle with that. Because if you're a Jew, do I still do I still go to the synagogue on Saturday? There's something about one of those commandments about keeping the Sabbath. Sunday is Sunday. They are two different events. Tough, tough transition. You know, tough transition. And um, Paul's going to address some of those issues and, and several of his opinions. Um, you have early church fathers who wrote about these problems. I'll give you a couple of quotes. Uh, in the epistle of Barnabas, he writes, Your present Sabbaths are not acceptable acceptable to me, but that is which I have made when giving rest to all things. I shall make a beginning of the eighth day. That is the beginning of another world. Wherefore also we keep the eighth day of joyfulness, the day also in which Jesus rose again from the dead. So what in the world is this eighth day thought? How many days in a week? You know, I think we all know that answer. So you, you, you have this eighth day idea regularly thrown around in the literature. So, so the eighth day would be the same as the first day. And the number eight is typically the number of new beginnings. So when you go for the Jewish feast, the prophetic significance of tabernacles, it's a week long, seven days, with an eighth day. And it's a Sabbath as well. And uh, it pictures the Sabbath, which comes after the millennium. It's really beautiful. A new beginning. The eternal age. So he writes something there. Ignatius writes in the second century, let every friend of Christ keep the Lord's day as a festival, the resurrection day, the queen and chief of all the days. So now in the second century, you know, it's not the Sabbath, it's the Lord's day. Uh, Tertullian writes at the uh, end of the second century, or early third, he says, uh, the Christians are those to whom Sabbaths are strange. What he's saying by that is by the third century, it wasn't an issue anymore. Most of the church was Gentiles, and, and for a Christian to go worship on the Sabbath would really be strange. That, that just wasn't happening by then. So uh, some interesting transitions are going on. We now have uh, uh, this time where Paul is preaching to them. And the, the word he uses here, um, continue his speech, the, the words that he uses really were uh, questions, it, it, kind of a dialogue question, the way he, he preached and then continued, he dialogued with them. He wanted to make sure uh, if they had any questions, uh, that, that there were answers. And that's a very powerful teaching technique, where you preach, but then you uh, give opportunity to say, hey, let's talk about it. Do you have questions on what I, what I spoke about? 
It was funny on Sunday night with Janet Pearson just out of the blue <laughs> raises a question. Well, that was great. I'm glad she felt at liberty to ask a question and, and it was nice to be able to answer or try to answer her question. But I think these Q and A times are very valuable uh, where people can ask questions, say, okay, what is our view on this? Or what is your view on this? Or how did you get to this conclusion in your service? Or these type of things. I think it's very, very helpful. So anyway, he's preaching to midnight and there were many lights in the upper chamber, so a pretty sizable house with an upper chamber, and uh, where they were gathered together. In verse 9, there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus. So in our classroom, we've got Seth, who's a younger teen. we got Samuel, who's a young adult. Um, just envision Samuel or, or Seth in a pretty large house, second story, uh, probably a pella windows, I'm sure, or Anderson. <laughs> and, uh, and houses are thick; they're stone, you know. And he's sitting in the window, you know, listening to this unbelievable preacher, the Apostle Paul. Who wouldn't have liked that occasion? And what's the beauty of the window seat? What would be? What would, I would like that. Cool seat. air. The cool air. <laughs> well, these are some pretty hot areas, so they have the fresh <laughs> evening air, and also. <laughs> These lamps are Those lamps are lamps. hot. They're hot. Sure they are. And stinky. A bunch of stinky, stinky people crowded into a house. So a stinky house, a smoky house, not a lot of air maybe circulating through the house. He had the best seat in the house. Okay. <laughs> now we can criticize him for falling asleep in the service, but think about it. He's in the right place. He's in the right church. Hearing the right kind of preaching with God's people. I'm glad he's there. And um, we need more young people. We need to pray more for young people. legs over and escape. <laughs> yes, and jump out from the second floor if it gets too hot in here. Well, this poor this poor kid, you know, it says Paul was long preaching. Of course, if you want to be, you know, Pauline and biblical, you, you preach long. It's just the way it is. Uh, these these are not homilies. These are not uh, little devotionettes. Uh, I don't wear a backwards robe. Uh, we preach long. You know. Mary Vos, who's of the Lord, Dick's online here. Dick, is this true that she'd get upset with me if I preached what what could be perceived a shorter message? That might be a forty minute or forty five minute <laughs> message. You could probably get away. Dick, with did it. you ever get an earful from Mary about length of sermons? I'm just curious. They were too short. Too short. I could preach 50, 55, 60 minutes. I thought you were. I do. <laughs> it wasn't enough for Mary. Mm -hmm. And others like her, they just wanted more and more and more. You know, not everyone has that endurance. And, and you know, this is this is a men's class. You know, so for some of us old men, how long can we sit? You have to go right. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's exactly what you're saying. You know exactly what I'm saying. You know what's nice about having a puppy? That we we schedule right. the puppy similar to the other to the old man schedule. <laughs> we're, on the, we're on the same schedule. Yeah. So, so, so I I heard for some of our men I may go 60 65 minutes. Well, that's on top of a 30 minute music section. So now we're an hour and a half. And we got some guys who are like, oh, please. Yeah, can't you, oh, can't you give us a potty break so we can come back? Yeah, I've been thinking of doing that. Yeah. I think that would probably be prudent. <laughs> Folks, let's just take a potty break right now and we'll come back and finish this thing. Hey, I'll keep going. <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll keep going. Yeah. I, I would like to have a service like this. We just have a three, six hour message. You know, yeah. I would personally love to do that. I'd love to do that. Just don't have it on Sunday when the Packers play. Yeah, 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 exactly. So Paul's long preaching, and this poor kid. And, and the word young man here, he's probably in his early teens. Um, he sunk down with sleep. And you, you know how that feels where you fight sleep, where you no, do man. the weave and bob. Why is it in church? I have no we, idea what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then, or you'll see someone doing the weave and bob, and, it, and it's hard to keep a straight face. You kind of laugh. Yeah. I imagine what you see from up there. Oh, I see it all. Yeah. Uh, I have seen some of the funniest things. I can't even repeat some of them. Yeah. Yes. A friend of mine was preaching a sermon, and he had a guy sitting in the back row, and the guy went to sleep and fell out of the chair. Oh, no. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> well, we, we would do this in seminary if a guy fell asleep in class. We always started a seminary class in prayer. If a guy fell asleep, you would nudge the guy and say, Hey, Steve. Stay there. Stay there. You were asked to pray. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's a dirty <laughs> trick. Class. 
There's a guy who wrote a song that's in our hymn book. Every time we sing his song, I think of what we did to him as one of the, I think it was in Greek class, you know, it's just kind of funny. But uh, this poor kid, he's fighting it, he's fighting it, and eventually he's out. <coughs> How high he's up, they're on the third. He fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And the way this thing is worded, guess who's writing this book? A coroner, a doctor, he's dead. So I, I've seen funny things in services. This again is a men's class, I wouldn't do this from the pulpit. But when men when, when men's pants drop to the floor by accident, where some guys are built like a funnel, and they're standing up, and I'm watching, and I'm saying, I just can't believe what I saw. I mean, all the way to the floor. Okay, okay. It's really hard to follow that with preaching and, and other things. But I've also seen in the service people who I thought just died. That one guy, Phoenix. There's several guys and ladies that in the service, I watched them, I'm just saying, okay, who can I get? Who can I get? Because I was watching these, their color, they were just losing it. And I really thought we had lost several to death in wow. the service. And we have a good crew that works here and get the nurses and doctors, get them out. And the ambulance is here within minutes. And I don't know if the person's alive or if they died. And I tell you what, it's hard to continue preaching when that happens. I'm telling you, you just say, oh boy, what happened there? They just die. And you try to keep the service going or whatever. And it's, it's very distracting when people die in the service. So this this guy's dead. I couldn't think of a better place to die. It's a great place make, to die. Make a note of that. Uh, I, I think of I think of uh, the great preacher George Whitfield. I've been to his church in New England. He died in the pulpit. He Did he the, really? Preacher. He's buried under his pulpit. Oh, he, what, what a great way to go. What a way to go. What a way to go. Yeah. Yeah. That was the most awesome church. If we ever get to go to Boston, yeah, I go to that. Uh, it's it, the church is his building, and uh, you can go up like a bell tower. And walk across the catwalk across the whole auditorium. It's made out of uh, uh, horse hair and other stuff. It's a really uh, interesting uh, fabric, and it takes you up to the bell, to the bell, which was uh, forged by a guy by the name of Paul, and uh, Paul Revere, and Paul <laughs> Revere, his store. And you go up there, and uh, it has a little wooden fence, maybe two feet high, three feet maybe. It's all rotten. And you're way, way up there. And I had the privilege of climbing that with the pasture there. Really special time looking around Boston from, from Whitfield's church. But Whitfield's under it. He died in the church service. Okay. Preaching. So anyway, Paul goes down and, and fell on him. Kind of reminds you of Elijah and Elijah with the uh, resurrection events in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. But Paul goes down, he falls on him, embraces him. And then he says, trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. He's alive now. Don't worry about it. No big deal. And the guy's resurrected. I mean, uh, wow. So Paul embraces the corpse, you know, puts a dampening on the point, on the service, but he is resurrected. And uh, notice what he does. He says, let's basically return. I'll get the point 26 or whatever he was on. Um, but this guy is raised from the dead. And uh, Spurgeon would say, remember, if we go to sleep during the sermon and die, there are no apostles to restore us. <laughs> and he is right. But verse 11, when he therefore was come up again uh, and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even until break of day, so he departed. So Paul took a little, hey, let's get some refreshments here. So let's get some pumpkin bread and banana bread. Mm -hmm. Let's have something to eat here. Just take a little break, get some food, get to get, you know, let's walk a little bit, a little bit. We don't need anyone else falling out the windows. Uh, it's really distracting. So let's get, let's eat and let's get back here and, and get this, get the service. And he preaches from midnight, a little break here, a little resurrection scene. And then he preaches till the morning, the break of day. And I like what happens next. I want you to answer what you think is going to go on here. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. And we, this is Dr. Luke now, There's, you'll see passages where it says we are us in that, Acts. That's when Luke is with Paul. He's not with him all the time. But when you see we, that's Dr. Luke. So we went before to ship and sailed unto Asos. Uh, they're intending to take Paul. So here they are. They're in, they're in Troas. Asos is 20 miles by land from Troas. It's 40 miles by sea. Okay. So... So they're ready to go in the morning. Ships, they're waiting for the, for the mission team. And Paul says, you know what? Um, 
you guys just get on the boat and I'll, I'll meet you over there at ASOS. I'm just, I'm just going to walk. So what does that, what do you think he did that? Why did he do that? It doesn't say, so this is just your guess or mine. But why did he set apart a 40 mile trip on, in a boat to walk 20 miles after he preached the entire night? Needed a break. Need time to spend with the Lord? I think both are right. What Ken said is very important. There are times when you guys work, you just you just want to leave me alone. I just want to chill. I just want a little, just a little peace and quiet. After okay. your day's over, so just, just a little, so maybe a break there. I tell you what, you preach eight, 12 hours, whatever he preached. He's wiped out. But uh, I, I think to have a little time with the Lord. Is there any other reasons he would do this? I mean, Jesus broke away from the crowd at that time, too. So. Yeah. yeah. I, I tell you, we all need this time away. We all need some little walks of Jesus time. We all need those times. Where we have, you know, it's great to be the wife of our Mary, or if we have kids, be with them. That's a blessing. But there are times we just need a little walk. <laughs> just a little quiet time. Some time of reflection. This was quite a night. But he's also leaving places he probably will never come back to. These are people he led to the Lord, people he loved. And where is he going? He's going to Jerusalem. And um, will he die there? Will he be at risk there? Does he think he'll die there? He's thinking. Does he jeopardize the guys in the boat? The last time they are going to get on a boat, he heard they were, he was going to be killed. He's a marked man. Does he give these guys a kind of a free ride? Does he does he distract the you know whatever that might be trailing him? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I I I love having some time alone. It rarely happens. It rarely happens. Uh, occasionally I'll get a, a time just alone in my truck or or whatever. <clears throat> uh, when I really need to get some things that I want to get alone, I don't. I like riding my motorcycle up the Gross Reservoir. I go up there periodically, just sit up there and take a Bible and read, just wherever, and just just get alone, just get alone. You know, we, we all need that time to be still and know God. Be still and know God. Okay. Uh, so sure enough, uh, they do meet back. They, they, the team meets up with Paul, you know, at ASOS. We took him in. And then we came to Mytilene. We sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Tragalium. And the next day we came to Miletus. So uh, quite a trip. You know, Chios, who was born there? <laughs> Homer, you know, so you got all these signs, birthplace of Homer. Samos, you know, if you're a math guy, you know who lived there, Pythagoras. <laughs> Pythagoras theory. Uh, so finally they get to Miletus, which is just 20 miles south of, of, of Ephesus. In Ephesus, Paul worked there for years, but he's on a trip south. He's got to get, he's got to get to Jerusalem, and he wants to be there before Pentecost, mid-June. With all of his might, he wants to get there. He can't afford too many delays. So he'd love to see all those pastors and people and friends back up in Ephesus, but to, to go to those 20 miles and then 20 miles back, he doesn't have a couple days uh, to play with. So he had sent word out to those guys, his friends, his pastors, that he's at Miletus. He's going to be there for just a short window. If they're in a position to meet him there, to come on down for a pastor's conference. So he sends the word up to these guys. So, first part of the chapter deals with a church service. Now we're going to get into into advanced leadership training. With what if we if Paul would organize a pastors conference, this is what it would look like. Topics at least. Chuck, great seeing you. Thanks. My allergies acting up. No. <laughs> Take care. Take care. I got gloves where I can practice the sneezing. You go sneeze and get <laughs> yeah. good to see you. Bye -bye. See ya. So uh, in, in this pastor's conference that's been held at the, on the coast at Hilton Head, and uh, I remember the first conference, pastor's conference I went to was at Hilton Head. I've never been more embarrassed in all my life. Uh, I was invited to it. Um, it was going to be on a 50, 60 special invite with pastors. And um, I didn't know if I, we'd had enough money to drive from Clemson to Hilton Head, South Carolina on the coast. I don't know if we had enough money to go there and back, things were tight. They just started ministry. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money to work with. And I just bought a car 
for four hundred and fifty dollars. It was a Dodge Monaco, 1973, and was as long as this room, maybe double this room. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. And it was a horrible yellow car looking. So Battleship Galactica, horrible <laughs> color, in South Carolina, air conditioning had way gone, yeah. had not, it did, hadn't worked probably for the last 200,000 miles. And um, was it a V8? <laughs> oh, yes, a thirsty V8. It actually ran decently. Mm -hmm. So I go, we go to the conference, it is at Hilton Head, have any of you been to Hilton Head? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's pretty Tony. So this for, is a five-star. This is a this is a resort uh, on the beach. We pull in, and these little men come in <coughs> beautiful suits, red with whatever on it, to take our car. Oh. <laughs> to park our car. <laughs> he knows he's not getting a tip. <laughs> I didn't have any money for no. tip. And our suitcase, they're going to take your suitcases. I didn't think anyone would even see my suitcase. We have a suitcase with bailing twine around it. Okay? And I, I, I don't have any business clothes. I only have, like, two suits. And this wasn't a suit thing. It was called business casual. I had beat up work clothes, and I had two suits. I had no business casual. So I'm feeling really kind of really very self-conscious. I give my suitcase with bailing twine to this little gentleman. <laughs> And then there, there goes my car with the BMWs and the Mercedes. And I know they must have died when they brought that car in there. And then I went into the building and had to run into the men's room. And there was a guy standing in the men's room. And it had colognes and hair brushes. <laughs> and and, and I, I, didn't know, I, I didn't need his assistance for things I needed to do. And, um, <laughs> but he wanted a tip. He wanted a tip. <laughs> I guess open the door, which was generous of him, but I had no money to give him. It was the most oh horrible, horrible, horrible conference. I mean, I'm so glad to get out of there. Oh man, just to get, eat a McDonald's. What would you say per meal back then? Wow, just to eat at McDonald's. Yeah. Okay, so they're going to meet at the coast. This is beautiful. This is a beautiful conference where Paul gathers these pastors from Ephesus and other churches uh, to meet with him, and uh, he's going to talk about four things: how to you know he's going to preach on the, the relationship with God. The relationship to their church, fellow believers, a relationship to un unsaved people, and a relationship really with themselves or family. So four major topics if you break it down. But more specifically, let's walk through his, his Bible conference. So verse 17, and from Lethus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. So first we have the elders. And I, I like that term. I don't always live up to it. An elder, um, very Jewish. You know, the Jews had elders in their, in their synagogues. It was men of, of maturity, men of maturity. So it's a title of maturity, uh, hopefully. So he calls these elders, these leaders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I've been with you at all seasons. So he um, he's not bragging, but he says, Look, you know, you, you we've had this relationship, and you know, from the very start with you guys, I didn't mess around. And you know, you know the ministry I had with you. You remember that. And he's going to share some qualities with them, not in a braggadocious way, but he's he is exemplifying the biblical truths that they as leaders needed to have. And I'm going to just say uh, the topic here is servant leadership. The first one, you know, how to be a good shepherd, how to be a good servant, how to be a good leader. And uh, I'll say serving servant leader, tying into the word verse 19. So he says, serving Lord, from the very beginning, I serve the Lord with all humility of mind. So he wasn't arrogant. He wasn't a proud man. He's not bragging here. He's just telling what, what happened. And he said, and with, with many tears. So his heart was engaged in, in his work. I mean, he was touched by people's infirmities and, and temptations, which befell me by lying in way of the Jews. He said, I came here to serve a man. It was... It was not a an easy easy assignment. I was, you know, they were going to kill me, and I'm wanting to kill me. But I came here, and this is how I serve with, with humility, and uh, with with many many tears. And it's neat to study Paul's writings to see when he cried. So there's three references to him actually crying with specifics. So let's just take a guess. What do you think would make Paul cry? Sadness or in like joy? 
sadness, brokenheartedness. He seen one of his church's testimonies destroyed. Okay, so crying over ministries that were, were hurt. Yeah, de definitely. Uh, he's going to definitely cry over that. Verse 29 and 30, when, when the wolves come in and they do damage, that's going to break his heart. And of course, if he's crying over, over churches being infected by disease, spiritual, you know, our Lord has a heart. He's grieved too, okay? Chapter 9 of Romans, you know, he talks about, it, you know, he had great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. And he's just absolutely broken. And it's the, it's the thought that his Jewish nation, his friends, his countrymen would die without Messiah. And I think, you know, if we're going to be more effective in our evangelism, I think we need to sow more tears. If we're going to enjoy joy in the morning. And uh, he was broken. He was his heavy heart over this. And um, he, he cried over Christians that were struggling spiritually and sinning and erring. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 4. So he, he cried. He, you know, he, men, men can cry. It's okay to do that. Um, I think as we get older, we have a tendency perhaps to be a little more, we're going to be weaker physically, but we may be a little weaker emotionally. It's very hard to say your goodbyes to, to loved ones. It's very hard to see friends dying. It's very hard to see friends laid off and struggling, and you, you worry about that. Where are, what are they going to do? You know, we, we have maybe a little more tears. And then he goes on here, beyond the topic of servant leadership examples, he, he now goes into uh, systematic theology, sound doctrine, biblical separation topics. He says, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. So he said, when I, when I taught you, I gave you steak, I gave you, you know, French fries, but I also gave you lima beans and broccoli and spinach and turnip greens. You know, I gave you a full diet, <laughs> whatever you needed. I didn't hold it back from you. I fed you. And, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from, and from house to house. So Paul is just sharing how important his teaching ministry was and how thorough he was and my, oh, my, to go house to house. Oof. You know, this is your 2020 text, and many people talk about 2020 vision. It involves getting the gospel to every person in your community. I don't know how many houses we have in Westminster, 17,000, whatever it is. Boy, to go to every house and have a gospel conversation, that would be really a wonderful goal. Paul, Paul was like this, just totally consumed getting the gospel out to people. Um, and he didn't hold anything back. You know, he said the tough stuff. He, he rebukes a Peter. <laughs> Um, when Peter was, uh, you know, acting hypocritically. So you have this topic of servant leadership. You have this topic of sound doctrine. It's just systematic theology. You have this doctrine of shepherding here. Um, he's testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, verse 21. And the message is repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So to change your thoughts, they have the right view of God, right thoughts toward God and right Trust in Christ as your Savior. So, uh, so shepherding and soul winning here. Uh, then he talks about surrender, the surrendered life in verses 22 through 24. What a great conference, you know, servant leadership, systematic theology, soul winning section, shepherding, uh, surrender. So he says, verse 22, And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save or except that the Holy Spirit witnesses in every city, city saying that bonds and afflictions abide me but none of these things move me neither can i my life dear unto myself so that i might finish my course with joy in the ministry which i've received of the lord jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of god so he is saying here i have this incredibly strong compulsion i'm going and i'm being told by multiple sources <laughs> one quite significant source if i go there i'm going to be arrested I will be put in, 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 in prison. I will be bound by chains. And, and we know that the next 11 years of his life, or whatever it may be, most of that's in prison. So this is a, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't have to go to Jerusalem, but that's where his countrymen are. He really is just absolutely constrained in his spirit. He's got to go. He's just got to do it. And everyone's saying, Paul, this is a suicide mission. Don't do it. Don't do it. If you go, you're not going to make it. Now, did Paul think he would survive the trip to Jerusalem just physically? And whatever your answer is, why would you say it? So he's going. To, he's going, and they're afraid he's going to be killed. But I think Paul remembers something. 
And you might remember back in Acts 9 when he was saved on the Damascus Road that, the, that Ananias would tell him what God's plan was. And it involved him going basically to Caesar, that his life would, he would witness the kings. He laid out, a, laid out the, the blueprint of his ministry. And uh, I think Paul, I don't think you forget that encounter. And so he hasn't, he hasn't witnessed to all the rulers yet and all the kings and an emperor. So that, I think he thought somehow, I don't know how I'm going to get there, maybe in a prison cell and in chains, but I'm going to get to Rome. I'm going to get there. So um, it, may be, it may not be pretty, but I think he thought he was going to get there by faith, trusting what the word of God had been given to him. So he's going to go. Verse 25, now behold... Hey, Kevin. Now behold, I know that ye all, Acts 20, 25, among whom I have gone preaching, the king of God shall see my face no more. This is this is rough. He's, he's leaving. They're not going to see him. He's not going to see them. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I'm pure from the blood of all men. I have, I have been, I have discharged my duties. I have given the gospel to every creature here. Uh, I have not held back. I have no, uh, my conscience is clear. I have not shunned to declare unto you the, all the counsel. I've given you everything. I've I'm not cut any corners of my doctrine or my teaching. You've been fully equipped. And now he says, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. So take, it's kind of like the, you know, you get on the airplane and they say, if, if we have a, you know, lack of oxygen in the cabin, uh, these masks will fall down. Please, parents, put the mask on first, <laughs> take care of yourself, and then help your wife or your kids. And spiritually speaking, you know, put the mask on first, take heed unto yourselves. And then your ministry. And a lot of guys get that backwards. And occasionally, at least, she'll be very, you know, weary with some of my choices and time spent and whatever. She'll say, you know, you've got a, you're, you're having an affair. I'll say, what? I'm having an affair? Yeah, you've got a mistress. Really? Who's my mistress, honey? The church. The church. You're having, you're, the church is your mistress. Oh, no, I, I'm not having an affair. <laughs> I love the church, but honey, you're first. Well, show it, <laughs> you know, kind of message, right? So take heed unto yourselves and make sure your, your home front is good. <laughs> uh, take that time. Keep your priorities right. And, and then other responsibilities, in this case, for these pastors under the, under the flock. And uh, over the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers. No, notice the word he uses here now. He used the word elder before. Now he calls them overseers. And uh, th this would be the word episkopos. This is your, your, your overseer, your bishop. That's the same word. So the word bishop or overseer. And uh, I don't like being called a bishop. <laughs> People call me that by being funny. Uh, but think of the word bishop, scopos, scope, bishop, you know, scope in it. Keep your eye on the ministry. You oversee it. You, you, you have a big picture. So these men are elders or overseers or bishops. And then the next word is interesting. To feed is the word, the verb. Uh, to feed means the shepherd or the pastor. So um, so you have the word shepherd here or pastor. You have the word bishop or overseer, the word elder, presbytera. So you have the, some different terms given to these guys, in the, all interchangeable, same people. To shepherd, to feed, uh, the pastor, the church of God, and I love this next phrase, which he, which he would bring back to God, has purchased with his own blood. Of course, God the Father, Spirit. So Jesus is the one who shed his blood. That's a reference to God. So speaking of God's blood, great text on the deity of Jesus. Jesus is God, and he shed his blood, the God Man. It's a very powerful passage there. And then he, then he knows this is coming. For I know this, that after my departing, I'm going to leave here. And he's saying, I'm giving you a heads up. They're coming. The wolves are coming. So grievous wolves enter in among you. And they're, they're, they, don't, they, they play for keeps. They take no prisoners, not sparing the flock. And then what really hurts, also of your own selves shall men arise. So you're going to have an attack from the outside with these wolves that might be in sheep's clothing. And then, then in the inside, you have these men who speak perverse things. And they're out trying to draw away disciples after them, not after the Lord, but after them. And uh, you, you see that in churches where you get these you know, people playing politics and trying to build their parties and follow me and just, I, you know, the diatrophies want the preeminence. So Paul's just telling them, look, this, this precious church bought with the blood of Jesus is going to be under attack, under siege. 
And you shepherds, you elders, you pastors, you bishops, you have got to protect these flocks. You know, you, you're, you're the wall. You're the insulation. You've got to do it. And, and the, he gives them this big, big charge to be faithful, uh, to stand in the gap, to, to con earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. A very, very powerful uh, section here. And, and, uh, and then from there, he says, now, brethren, I commend you to God. I, I'm just going to give you to God <laughs> and to the word of his grace. And I look at these passages for change into the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all men, all them which are sanctified. So here's a powerful sanctification text. We've gone a long way to get to it uh, in the, some of these other verses. But this is a beautiful passage. We can't change apart from the grace of God. We can't change apart from the sanctifying effects of the word of God. Uh, we, have to, we have to be the set apart ones, these saints. Trusting the Lord for grace to win, be victorious. And then Paul says, look, when I served, I, I, I wasn't here for money. <laughs> I've, I've coveted no man's silver, gold, or apparel. Yea, you yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I've showed you all things that are so laboring. You ought to support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And I love this phrase for a number of reasons. Here's an amazing beatitude. It's more blessed to give than to, re to receive. And where do you find that in the Gospels? What, what verse in John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John can, is he quoting here? What's the reference? you have that reference in your margins? Luke 14. What is that? Luke 14, 12. What's that saying? Well, it's just a cross reference. Yeah, what's, read it for us. <clears throat> All righty, Luke 14, 12. Uh, then said he also to them that bade him, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. Okay. So he's talking about, you know, giving, in this case, a meal or whatever to someone. Do, do stuff for people that can't reciprocate. And it, by implication, it means it's more blessed to do it this way. But this verse isn't in the Gospels. So it, it's one of those quotes where, the, where the, Paul's quoting Jesus, but it's not in the Gospels. So how many more things did Jesus say that didn't get into the Gospels? I mean, is the Gospels comprehensive of every word that Jesus ever said or taught? No, no, no. Yep. So, so could this be uh, something that Paul was instructed in while he was in the wilderness of Damascus during the direct, like he says, the Lord delivered to him yeah. in First Corinthians 11, 23 through 25. Yeah, yeah, very possible. Doesn't tell us specifically how he got this message from Jesus, this beatitude, but yeah. It's very, very powerful, though. It's more, you know, some of us are parents. If you can teach your kids to be givers and not takers, just that truth alone, they could just become givers and not takers. You've done a great job as a parent. Mm -hmm. And we hear the little saying, there's two types of people in the world. They're the takers and the givers. And um, I want to be on the giving side. I want to be on the giving side. And uh, I, I know most of you pretty well. You guys are givers. And, uh, it, it, it's, you're more blessed. It's more blessed to give than receive. And, uh, it's, a, it's a great way to be, great way to live. All right. And then finally, and when he has thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. In front of all these pastors, these elders, they, then they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck. And they kissed him, uh, sorrowing most of all for the words which, for which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him under the ship. And um, the, this is hard when you when you love people and you've served them for a while, and you say, "Hey, look, I, 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 I've got to go." Um, sometimes you see that with people who die, their last words. Uh, we had a fellow here in our church. Uh, Stutzman was his name. I don't know if I remember Stutzman. He had a, a company that um, fixed garage doors that had problems. And uh, he was a really nice guy. His wife, uh, she was a character. She was a great bowler. She, her average, I think, was 175. But she was often bowling games 200, 225, 230. And I'm not a bowler, but I think that's pretty good for a lady in her 70s. Um, <laughs> wow. Mr. Stutzman, he had a, had a rare disease. And, breathing thing and the only way he could stay alive was on the machine and um, he uh, he said to his family um, 
I, I, I'm not going to, this is not, I, I'm going to just go home. I'm, just, I, I'm not going to do this for long. And he said, I want the whole family to come. I want pastor to come. And, um, and we're just going to have a service together in the hospital. And uh, Stutzman and his wife and all of his kids and grandkids, just all around the room, we filled the whole room. I gave a little, some scripture reading, whatever. And we sang, oh, we sang, we sang uh, no, six, seven, eight, nine hymns. And and then um, he, he went around to each of the kids and the parents, uh, the, his, uh, the grandkids. They all come up and say, granddad or dad, I love you. And just hug and kiss him. And he said, I love you, son. I love you, I love you. And then um, I said, I love you. And we all said, I love you. And finally, his wife, I love you. Honey. And then uh, the nurse took him off the machine. And then, I mean, two, three minutes, four minutes, maybe five at the most, in heaven. Uh, there was not a dry eye in the room. Okay, uh, we were we were all just. It was devastating. It was devastating. We say goodbye, and that was a cheerful goodbye. Uh, we had a fellow, uh, Zed Henderson, who was a student at IBC, up and rising star in our church, young man, nice looking kid, and he got he got sideways and and, and took his life. That was just well back. What's that? Last year? No, this is about five years ago. Was it? And I tell you what, to be of his family after he took his life sitting in this office, and I had I had um, um, Eric uh, Penley's wife, Chris, Chris, she's interpreting, and we're talking about seven of the family, and we're just we're trying to have our memories, and we're going to have a funeral and say goodbye, and I'll say goodbye, you know. And uh, Chris had a meltdown; she had a total meltdown. Mm -hmm. She was trying to interpret for me, and she just couldn't get she couldn't tell me words. She grabbed my hand, just grabbed my hand. She total meltdown. And then we went to the we went to the funeral home, and um, because of the way Zed took his life, it wasn't an open casket. And no funeral home in, in Denver would would allow the family to see him. Uh, and they wanted to see him. No, they wanted to see him. They wanted to say their goodbyes. And uh, we finally found a, a funeral home in uh, North Glen to do it. A couple guidelines, and I've never seen a more tearful goodbye in ever in my life. As they hugged the casket, and hugged that boy in that casket, and said their goodbyes. So it's hard to say goodbye to people that die or are dying. This is a pastor, pastor. This is Christian friendships here. I mean, this is telling you, these guys. This was not shallow. And I feel that I know personally myself, I get stretched so thin. I feel that's so shallow in my relationships, and I hate it. I hate it. You know. And guys, I can't tell how often I'll talk to a guy in our church. He'll say, Pastor, um, I really don't have a friend. I really don't have a friend. I mean, I got a wife, maybe, you know. Uh, I, had, I have people in the church I know. I like our church, I'm, but I really don't have a close friend. And if we surveyed here, I won't do that. I won't, wouldn't want to embarrass anyone, but probably over half of us would say, you know what? I would like to have a deeper relationship with a guy in the right way, a biblical, you know, Jonathan David relationship. Um, not a friend, not a friend that I can trust, has my back, that I can talk with. And we have that with Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Praise the Lord for that. He's a Amen. friend. He's a friend that sticks closer than anyone else in this room. We, we know that. But um, these guys had something here. I think the reason there's such a bond is, is what had knit their hearts together was Christ and serving him. And we, we can talk about ball games and we're going to talk about motorcycles. We're going to talk about whatever, whatever. We love it. It's nothing wrong with it. But, but at the heart of this relationship with these guys, it was all about salvation, serving God, <coughs> so being surrendered, making their life count for the Lord, influencing other people. And when you have a team like that, with that, that's the heartbeat of the group. Man, now you're in the trenches. Right. Now you're in the trenches and you're fighting with each other, fighting the good fight with, you know, standing toe to toe with each other against the foe. So, um, beautiful passage, wonderful, wonderful chapter in the book of Acts. And I love the sanctification text, verse 32, once again. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. And we can change with the power of the word of God, by the grace of God. We can change. Okay, any comments, questions on chapter 20? <clears throat> you have to come. Just a note on, I, I, I don't know exactly if, if this would fit in, but um, sometimes 
when someone's sharing with someone else on that, trying to, to share on that level, it bounces back as if you're trying to be some great spiritual giant that, and you're sharing them and you're, you're, it, it, you're bragging. And, and, it, and I would just want to encourage everybody that if someone's sharing with you, be interested. I mean, that's what this is talking about. That's what I long for because I, I, there's been times when I've shared with people and, and you get this blank stare like, why, why are you telling me this? Like, what do you think you're something special? And and that was not my motive at all. It was my motive was to be an encouragement and and be. I'm excited when I get to share, you know, share with somebody or something like that. So yeah, that, that's Amen. what we need Amen. more in this church. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Other comments on this topic before we close. I think a men's class like this is fantastic. I think our prayer meetings of men are fantastic. These are good things. Is this our last class? Because I thought she said something today in the email that she sent this. They said this was the last Oh, office. last installment of notes. No, we're going to keep this class okay. cooking, man. This has been too good. Okay. That's kind of you know, and Pastor John, you actually, you just started. <laughs> hey, John. Well, you nice class actually goes John Pastor midnight. could have said, yeah, this is the last one. Yeah. See you next year. Yeah. But he didn't. See, he yeah. wants you back. Yeah. <laughs> we missed your opportunity. Uh, I just <laughs> started. I came you guys, first. if you don't know, John and I are buds. <laughs> we, just, we just harass each other. We are. We're we're just thankful we weren't together in our teenage yeah, we'll, years we'll or early twenties. We'd be in jail or dead. Yeah. yeah, we'd be under the jail. We, yeah, yeah. And John's one of my tempters. We'll go out for lunch or whatever. <laughs> we haven't been out for a while. It has been a while. There's a Probably reason, a year. John. I'm gonna yeah. wait, and I'll get there. And John will say, well, "You want to do dessert?" I said, "No, no, John. It's a mustard meat. Come on, no." He said, "Oh, we gotta do it." And then he gets the biggest thing in the house. I mean. <laughs> This monster ball. You know, I was trying to train to load him up with a telling the waitress one time. Ah, bring it. He said, No, not just bring it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John. Yeah. yeah that yeah. I done, thought, well, I might get trouble with her shovel. I'll get in trouble with Elisa. So, yes, yes, you, you have. <laughs> yes, Troy. Yes, well, we were talking about just being friends with other men, and we see this bond yep. um, with these men and Paul. And there's a, a saying, I don't know where I heard it, but you, you don't make old friends. You don't make words, old you friends. You can't make old friends. Oh, um, I get it. Right. Yeah. You got to start with a new friend, and it takes time right. to build an old, to make an old friend. So you can't make old friends. You earn them or you know, through life, yeah. you, know, you make old friends. So they were old friends. They've gone through things together. And so this, even this class here. Yeah. Is a way that we can begin making old friends yeah. uh, with each other. And hopefully, yeah, I like person. that. Your dad reached out to me today when I was in a class teaching. I couldn't take oh. his call. It's the second time he's called me. I haven't called him back yet. I will. And if any, any of you know Bob Dylan, he had a dear friend that just died. He was pretty mm -hmm. devastated with that news. If you know him, just call him. His number's in, in the directory. Just call him. Say, I'm so and so. Uh, I heard Pastor mention you lost a friend recently. I'm so sorry. And I pray for you that we go along with this. And he's really lonely. COVID, he's been shut in a covenant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, he has a client antique yeah, Cadillac, yeah. But, but you think about this, and this may sound trite, but he has a little dog named Penny. COVID hits, his health hits, and he's taken to the covenant and he can't take the dog. Okay. His wife died a couple of years ago. And that dog, Penny, was everything. I'm highly allergic to that dog. He loved that dog. Um, it was a Shih Tzu, maybe? Mm -hmm. Adorable. I mean, it was a good dog. So Dwayne Richards, you talk about a friend. Dwayne Richards, I'll take your dog. Mm -hmm. I'll just, so it's, 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 it's Penny Dylan Richards is her full name. Penny Dylan Richards. So, but yeah, that's hard. When you lose a spouse and you lose your life and you lose, the day's going to come when someone's going to say, I'm taking your keys. That's a hard thing for men when they when they take your keys, okay? But that day may come too when just you shouldn't be driving. You shouldn't be driving. Those are hard times. I'm I'm there right now. <laughs> and everybody tells me get off the road. <laughs> yes, Mark. Pastor, I have a kind of a more 
I got the I got uh, hearing aids. Nice. And well, they're a trial pair. The uh, full price would be, I figured it out, twenty nine hundred and fifty dollars, almost yes. three thousand yes. dollars. Yes. I mean, I didn't think. I th I thought maybe five six hundred bucks. It's twenty six. Uh, a Honda Sh a Honda Shadow, uh, seven fifty, also costs around. I can't I can't afford both. <laughs> Get the bike. Get the bike. Get the bike. Get the bike. Yeah. Black and chrome. That's the way it goes. Right. Those things are really loud. Those. You know, before I before I got these things, yes. you know, Kevin he sounded normal. Now he sounds like this. <laughs> I was just gonna say I don't know if there's anything I want to I want to hear that's worth it. I resemble that. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Congratulations. That's great news, though. That's a, that's a good sure news. I'm sure in one <laughs> that sounds <laughs> normal. Yeah. Hey, do you notice the difference? Nice. I do. Nice. Because, well, you know, mine, my, they did a Zing. chart for my uh, hearing loss, and it's the opposite. You know, 4, 000, 1K, 4,000, 8,000 is normal. Mine's around, you know, 500 hertz, 700 hertz. So, that's, so man, then. But so it's the opposite of where you know normally so I had to calibrate it so I can hear you know yeah, like, this, especially this group I've really noticed a difference. Nice, good. You get good. background interference any kind of background noise? Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of like at work, there's a lot of you know, it just sounds like a wall of sound. Yeah. So, Mark, can you show the guys your the other issue that you deal with? Or are they related? They What's that? What's that? I don't You know, uh, Rush Limbaugh, rest his soul, had, you know, deafness because yes. the, and this is what happens here. I'm hoping what happened here is not happening in there. Yeah. So, so tell the guys what your, 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 your skin condition, what do you? Alopecia like? totalis. Sure. So, yeah. So Just explain uh, this. So what does alopecia totalis mean? It means uh, basically bald everywhere. Oh, yeah. Totalis it means total. Uh, it, it, it's it's an autoimmune. It's, it's an autoimmune. Auto yeah. Uh, the sort you've heard of it. Yeah. So, yeah. so this is why this is why God invented Air Force hats. <laughs> so, the reason, so the reason it hurts your hearing is because the they don't know that they I I was the audiologist. They didn't say one way or the other. She thinks the impression I got was it it wasn't. Wasn't related. It wasn't related. So. Because in the cochlea, oh, there yeah. are fibrous projections that are, yes. are in the hair family. Yeah. So it would I'll be sitting on the left side of the sanctuary here before long. This. Yeah. I got a quick question. I just it's been I've been wanting to ask yes. you for the past okay. ten minutes. Have you, John and Kevin, went out on an outing and just got in trouble? <laughs> We've never all been together. Oh, oh. do that combo? I would not do that. John is enough. I'm <laughs> sorry. I wouldn't fit in the group. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. Oh. oh, so much feelings are hurt. <laughs> that was brutal. That's the, what, what I think we better pray. Yeah, right, Sam. I'm not even sure if I'm on prayer. <laughs> oh. Sam, would you close us in prayer, please, sure. my friend? Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we bow before you, and Father, we thank you and praise you for who you are, and Father, that we serve a the God of all creation, the God of our so. salvation, and Father, we thank you for your Word. Uh, thank you for pastors breaking it to us tonight and just the challenge of um, the Apostle Paul and and uh, how he served you uh, with everything he had. And Father, we confess that we believe helped our unbelief. Yes, Lord. Help us to uh, just dedicate ourselves more completely to your word. Yes, Lord. And, and Father, just make the changes in our lives that we need to make for your honor and glory and lord we uh, know that we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and father we just pray that you would keep your hand upon us may god the holy spirit move in our hearts and lives we pray and lord we just want to say we love you we love you very much and thank you that we can love you because you first loved us and yes, gave lord. yourself for us now guide us direct us through the remainder of this evening we pray for we ask it in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sam. Thank you, guys. That's awesome.